We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today uh, after a very long and uh, an interesting, very, very interesting event. Um, I'm excited to be moderating this panel on human rights impact assessments throughout the life cycle of AI systems. My name is Alexandru Kachumaru and I am the European Public Policy Lead at the Ada Lovelace Institute which is a research-based uh, institute uh, with a mission to ensure that AI and data work for people and society, which is based in London uh, and founded by the Nafil Foundation. I am based in Brussels, uh, working on the European uh, uh, proposal on the Artificial Intelligence Act. And it's my pleasure to, um, to be moderating the panel today. We'll have a very, very interesting panel, but uh, before uh, starting to introduce all the speakers, I will do uh, some housekeeping rules. So for everybody to be aware of the structure of the event, uh, I will start by asking each of the panelists a broad question to get the debate started. They will each have five to seven minutes to respond to this broad question. And once uh, all panelists have taken the floor, I will open up the discussion to everybody else and I will take uh, questions both from the chat uh, and from uh, Twitter, where I also think you can ask your questions using the session specific hashtag. So there are two hashtags. The first is IGF 2021, hashtag IGF 2021. And the session specific hashtag is hashtag WS, so uh, from workshop 196. And I'll also leave it in the chat uh, for everybody to be able to use it. Uh, once uh, one of the panelists is speaking, I will ask everybody else to mute themselves and turn the camera off uh, so they can have the floor completely to address the question that I asked them. And uh, as I said at the end, I will open the floor to everybody else and we'll have one big discussion. Uh, I would suggest being ready to, to take notes. I have my paper and pen next to me uh, because it, it will certainly be a very, <laughs> a very, very uh, fruitful conversation uh, and we'll, everybody will have a lot to learn. That being said, enough uh, about me and the session. I will start by introducing all the panelists one by one and then uh, asking each one of them a question in turn. Starting with Laura Galindo Romero, who is a member of the OECD AI Policy Observatory. As part of the work, uh, as part of her work, she coordinates the joint uh, European Commission and OECD database on national AI policies and conducts policy analysis on national strategies, policies, and regulatory approaches on AI uh, from over 16, 60 countries and the European Union. Thank you very much, Laura, for being with us today and uh, looking forward to, uh, to asking you a question in just a minute after introducing the rest of the panelists. Uh, next on the list to go is Professor Frederick Zwiedervin Borgesius, who is a professor, uh, and I do apologize uh, if I got the, the, the surname incorrectly, uh, who is a professor of information, communication, and technology and law at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, there, he is affiliated with the IHUB, which is an interdisciplinary research hub on security, privacy, and data governance. His interests uh, include privacy, data protection, and discrimination, especially in the context of new technologies. Uh, and in 2019, the Council of Europe asked him to write a report on discrimination, artificial intelligence, and algorithmic decision making. And I'll have to say that I have used his work extensively in the thesis, which I just uh, finished writing back in the summer. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, Frederick, uh, and very excited to ask you a few questions. Uh, speaking of the Council of Europe, I'm going to use that as a segue to introduce Mr. Christian Bartoli, who is head of digital, who is the head of the digital development unit and the secretary to the CAHAI, which is the ad hoc uh, committee on artificial intelligence at the Council of Europe. Uh, and I know that there are quite a lot of 
developments coming out from the work of the Kahai, Mr. Bartolin. So uh, very excited to, to hear you speak uh, in, in just a minute. Then moving on uh, down the list of panelists, it's Daniel Lofer. Uh, Daniel works as a Europe uh, policy analyst at Access Now uh, in the Brussels office, and he works with issues around artificial intelligence and data protection with a focus on facial recognition and other biometrics. Previously, he was hosted by Access Now as a Mozilla Fellow from October 2019 to July 2020. And during his Mozilla Fellowship, he worked with Access Now to develop AIMeets.org, a website that gathers resources to tackle the eight most common myths and misconceptions about AI. Uh, and Daniel is uh, somebody who also I had the pleasure to, to know personally, and I know uh, about uh, the work that he's doing. So also very, very excited to hear more about what he has going on just before um, Christmas and before that, the, the year ends. And then uh, Cornelia Kuter, uh, who is EU Senior Director, EU, uh, it's, who is Senior Director of EU Government Affairs Apologies um, at Microsoft, Privacy and AI Policies, Corporate and External and Legal Affairs. Uh, in her role, uh, Cornelia is responsible for privacy and AI policies in the European Union with a focus on how new technologies impact society and how laws and regulatory frameworks will evolve to meet expectations of society. She's currently leading a team working on corporate affairs and regulatory policies, including competition, market content regulation, responsible data use and privacy, as well as telecommunication. Uh, I'm really happy to call uh, Cornelia a mentor. So uh, it's uh, it's very nice to to be able in the to be in the position to ask her questions. I have learned a great deal from her, uh, and I'm sure everybody else present today will learn a lot from uh, from her speech and from answer to the questions. So having introduced everybody and uh, potentially misspelled some names in the process, for which I apologize again. Uh, I'm in the possession of a long, complicated name, so I know how that feels. Um, I will give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Ms. Laura Galindo Romero. And the question to get uh, everything started is that the OECD has released its uh, principles for artificial intelligence uh, over two years ago now, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was back in May 2019. So I'm curious, and I think everybody else is curious, is where do you see things going right now? Um, what has happened in the past two years and where do you see human rights impact assessment uh, popping up in the work of various uh, nations and uh, in the European Union? Over to you. Thank you so much to Mauro and thank you so much to the organizers for putting together this great panel and, and to my fellow co-panelists. So at the OECD, ever since the adoption of the OECD principles, by now over 46 countries have adopted the OECD principles and serve as the basis also for an agreement with G20 countries, also on trustworthy AI. We have been developing a plethora of, of initiatives. First and foremost is the OECD Policy Observatory, which gathers data and, and evidence based on policies, trends, uh, to inform countries, uh, but also inform anyone because it's publicly available on how countries are, 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 are following their AI policy journeys uh, with, with data and, and with policies. And, and this is a, a collective effort, uh, thanks to, of course, the contributions by countries, but, but also insights from experts. Um, ever since the, the adoption of the principles and the launch of the observatory, we also launched a group of experts convening more than 200 members from all over the world with expertise on AI. Um, and we, we put them in, in three different groups. And one of those is developing a classification system, a classification framework for AI systems, which uh, uh, basically looks to how to understand the different types of AI systems as they raise different AI policy considerations and legal issues. So we hope that together with, 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 with the experts, but also uh, to see how this fit in, together with other intergovernmental initiatives, particularly the work of CAHA and the European Commission and others, on how to assess risk for different AI systems. So we, we hope to launch the classification framework available to all early next year. So something to look up for because really it's going to calibrate and hope to, to keep informing uh, these developments and, and how to understand the different AI systems. Um, the other work that uh, another working group is doing and which is very relevant for this discussion, is mapping the different categories of tools for accountability of, of AI systems 
including human rights impact assessments. We have seen that different AI actors, companies, trade unions, civil society have developed a, a plethora of, of tools for accountability. Uh, we see also requirements envisioned by, by, by the current legislative proposals. And the idea is to understand which are these different tools, how can they, they, they be combined to inform uh, emerging regulatory developments. So, so I think um, my, my, my fellow co-panelists would comment more on these, but, but how, well, one question is how these non-regulatory tools or regulatory tools will, will be an inform um, together the implementation of trustworthy AI. So, so this is something to look at for uh, in the following months. And last but not least, what are countries now? So this year we launched a report informing how states are implementing the, the, the OECD principles. And we found very interesting um, insights. I invite you all to, to visit the report. It's available at oecd.ai slash policies. And, and basically one of the main insights is that countries have moved from, 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 from principles to practice through their national AI strategies by implementing, um, by implementing, for instance, policies for to invest in research and development, and research and development also in foundational research for trustworthy AI, for more transparency, for explainability of AI systems. Countries have also um, implemented policies for digital infrastructure for AI, making it more accessible to AI compute capacity. Countries are also implementing a series of of experimentation initiatives to promote a regulatory sandboxes. We're at a very, very early stage, but, but this is something that is coming and it's gonna help inform also all these developments as we learn more uh, from AI breakthroughs. And, and of course, one of the priorities for countries AI, is AI skills and develop and, and education and the future of work. And here I would like to focus on, because uh, when we look at human rights impact assessments and, and, the, and the need for, social technical expertise, human capacity becomes first. And, um, and this is a priority for countries. We're seeing this in national AI strategies, but of course, there's much more work to be done. We are very keen to look forward on um, what's gonna happen with, with impact assessments. There are some countries, Canada, that implemented in 2018, the Directive for Automated Decision-Making, but it's, there's still much more to be done. It has been adopted, it has been implemented just recently and there are a few uh, impact assessments uh, and enforcement cases that, that we're seeing. So we're really at a, at a very early stage on, on impact assessments uh, and we're, we're looking more for, for what's gonna happen. And I know my, my colleagues are gonna delve into this a little bit more, but, but just to give you an overview of where countries are in addition to regulatory developments that we know the EU um, the EU AI Act legislative proposal, also even a bill of rights uh, that puts, of course, human rights and civil liberties at the heart of, of proposals in the US. Two sectorial approaches and initiatives. And, um, and even recently, uh, an, an, another legislative proposal coming from Brazil for AI systems. So a lot is happening. Um, and again, navigating the complexity of policies, regulatory developments, and, and, and tools for trustworthy AI is the aim of the policy observatory to help countries, stakeholders, regulators, civil society navigate the complexity of these issues. Um, so I, I leave it to that and thank you so much, Sir Kim and everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. That, that, that was very, very interesting. And I took some notes and uh, looking forward to ask some questions uh, later on. Uh, moving, you, moving on to you, Frederick. Laura has mentioned the, um, the EU AI Act uh, a little bit, and you have wrote extensively about, uh, about European Union, the European Union legal framework uh, and the, how artificial intelligence is going to impact it, as well as other emerging technologies. So the question for you is, um, where are human rights impact assessments in EU law um, and what can we learn from how they are currently used, if they are used there at all? Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, so um, I'm going to first answer under current law and then, um, and then um, suggest a bit what we could consider for upcoming law. So currently, there is not really a hard requirement for human rights impact assessment. However, we do in Europe, we have the best 
uh, data protection law in the world uh, for the moment, the GDPR, with, with a hard requirement for a data protection impact assessment. So currently, um, um, organizations for almost any AI project are required to do such a data protection impact assessment. Um, so the advantages that is unlike um, uh, self-regulation or ethics guidelines or suggestions by NGOs, which are all useful, this is a hard requirement. Um, and um, um, the GDPR suggests that an organization doing such a data protection impact assessment should consider all fundamental rights. So I would say for the moment, unless there are other hard requirements, let's just um, enforce the laws that we have. Um, um, and of course, for organizations, just comply with what we have. Um, the, the data protection impact assessment requirement, um, non-discrimination law, etc. cetera. Um, and there's quite some experience now because before the GDPR already, um, uh, it was possible uh, to do privacy impact assessments. And uh, there's lots of literature and ex uh, experience, etc., cetera, um, with these impact assessments. Um, and ideally, when you do such an impact assessment, you um, uh, it's not only by lawyers, but you also take uh, tech knowledge into account. And also very importantly, uh, domain specific knowledge. So if it is about databases um, used for immigrants, then um, uh, people working in that field uh, should be involved and ideally also the affected people. And if you're, if it's an impact assessment about predictive policing, then domain specialists from that field should be involved, etc. So I would say, at least for Europe, well, but this probably goes for the whole world, start with enforcing the rules that you have. That is a good starting point. Then in the future, um, because I'm not saying the data protection impact assessments are ideal for uh, AI projects, um, because um, the focus is still not exclusively, but the focus is still more on uh, personal data related questions. Um, in the future, we probably need a hard requirement in law for an artificial intelligence impact assessment. Did we decide already? Will it be called an AIIA? Um, and um, when drafting such a requirement, we can take inspiration from uh, other countries, from NGOs, um, and also from uh, countries outside the European Union. And I think there it should be written in the law that there's a requirement to um, involve uh, uh, legal specialists, technologies, and um, um, people with domain-specific expertise, like I said. Um, um, Perhaps so the, the AI Act has some hints in this direction. I'm um, not completely convinced that the AI Act is the best way of regulating AI, but the train seems to be on the rails and um, it seems not so likely that we start with a clean document again. Um, well, that's a political, um, or it seems to be a political reality. Um, so I guess the best we can do is um, trying to improve that proposal and I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. I, I really like the AIIA, not to be confused with the AIA, which is the oh, proposal. Perhaps but, not, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's a lovely idea. I think all of us will have to get used to, uh, to this, but I, I quite like the AIIA, and uh, and I'm sure we'll have a discussion later on about uh, about what you mentioned about the AIA uh, and about uh, how we can uh, improve it. Um, moving on to uh, to Christian uh, and to the importance given to to human rights impact assessments by the CAHI. Uh, and again, for those of you who have joined a bit later, the CAHI is the ad hoc committee of the Council of Europe on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I hinted a bit earlier that uh, there are some developments coming up from uh, some important developments coming out of the work of the CAHI, uh, and some of them are related to human rights impact assessment. So, uh, Christian, if you'd like to expand on that, uh, that would be that would be great. 
Thank you very much, uh, much Alex. And uh, yes, indeed, I can confirm that uh, the Kahai actually has finalized its work on the 2nd of December and has now submitted its final report to the Committee of Ministers. For the time being, it is unfortunately not a public document, but it will become once the Committee of Ministers has discussed it next in the beginning of next year. But I can give you some insights to it, obviously. Um, the Kahai had been asked, as you know already, which is a public document and available on the Council of Europe's website, to produce a feasibility study, and that was done last year. Um, then uh, this year, the uh, focus was on identifying the elements that could become part of a legally binding and non-legally binding instruments uh, on the uh, use of, on the sorry, on the design, development, and use of AI applications or AI systems. Uh, uh, in relation to human rights, uh, democracy, and the rule of law, the three areas in which the Council of Europe is uh, the competent uh, international organization. Um, we have indeed also, as part of that exercise, proposed to the Committee of Ministers that a legally binding instrument on AI, a kind of a framework convention, if you like, on AI, should in, uh, include a legal basis for the establishment of uh, human rights, rule of law, and democracy impact assessment. And then the impact assessment model itself would be fleshed out in another instrument uh, uh, in order, you know, uh, to have the two uh, not in the same instrument, but uh, to, to ensure that we can add an easier uh, update uh, the um, the the model itself uh, as you know i don't want to go into the details of international law but as you know treaties are very difficult to amend once they have entered into force it requires all the parties to 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 go through certain motions and in order to have a, a better and more flexible approach we have decided to keep the actual model at this stage at least this is the idea that we'll keep the actual model apart from the legal basis but the legal basis will be a binding one so for those states that would like to join our convention, and I would like to say here that Council of Europe conventions are open to all states, more or less, around the world, uh, this is, uh, they would then, uh, they would then uh, actually be able to, uh, or rather be obliged to ensure that in their domestic law, they have uh, the basis for creating an impact assessment on human rights democracy and rule of law. As Professor Borgisius uh, mentioned before, uh, I think that the, the, the real issue sometimes is that we we have a lot of, we, we know that there's a need for impact assessment with, with regards to human rights, but we do not necessarily always have the legal basis. And this is one uh, instrument that would potentially provide uh, this legal basis for those states that become parties to it. So that would be an improvement, certainly. Then what would this Huderia, uh, as we call it, human rights, democracy, rule of law, impact assessment, we, we call it Huderia, we had AIIA, now we have Huderia. So I think in the end, we'll maybe have the last hooray, but at the, hopefully, but insofar as we are working on now, I think what we are looking at is something which has to be done. It's, um, when there is a clear and when there are clear and objective indications of relevant risks uh, emanating from the application of an AI system, so we would not have to do it if the AI system is dealing with your with your toaster or your coffee brewer or something like that. That is not really well. It could be coffee at least can be a human rights issue, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it is when it when they are when an AI system is used in a in a setting where it is sensitive to human rights. There we should, or, or the functioning of democracy, or the respect for the rule of law principles, then we should uh, apply this, uh, then there should be this formalized impact assessment taking place. And that requires that all AI systems undergo an initial review in order to determine whether or not they should be subjected uh, to, to the formalized assessment. And it is also recommended that uh, 
indications as to or regarding the necessity for more extensive assessment should also uh, be further developed. That is also one of the uh, recommendations of the council of, of this ad hoc committee on uh, AI that uh, you mentioned. Uh, and finally, we should also look into whether the using of an AI system in a new or different context or for a different purpose should not, or other, other relevant changes to the system should not mean that we would require a reassessment of the, of the AI system. So in that sense, it would be a rolling uh, um, undertaking, not just something you do at the very beginning or at the very end, but throughout the life cycle of an AI system. And of course, uh, uh, if the AI system changes in some ways, then it may actually go from being, for instance, not uh, relevant for, for, for human rights to become very relevant for human rights. So this is this or, or the or, or vice versa. So, you know, this is uh, this is the approach. Finally, I would say that the 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 model should at least contain four let's say main steps that could be uh, that could be part of it and these are risk identification so identification of the relevant risks for human rights democracy and rule of law the second one is the impact assessment itself it should the assessment of the impact should take into account the likelihood and severity of the effects of the effects on those rights and principles that i mentioned before the governance assessment there should be an assessment of the roles and responsibilities of duty bearers right holders and stakeholders in implementing and governing the me mechanisms to mitigate the impact and then there should as a fourth step there should at least be mitigation and evaluation that is identification of suitable mitigation measures and ensuring a continuous evaluation as i mentioned before when you look into the impact assessment step uh, you should see that there are a number of elements that the CAHI has already identified that could be part of that. That could be the context and purpose of the AI system, the level of autonomy of the system, the underlying technology, the complexity of the AI system, the transparency and explainability of the system and the way it is used, human oversight and control mechanisms for the AI provider and AI user, data quality, system robustness and security, involvement of vulnerable groups or persons, and uh, the scale on which the system is used, its geographical and temporal scale, that is also something that should be taken into account because of course, scale has an impact on, 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 uh, on, on let's say the size, <laughs> if you like, of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of, of, of a potential breach of human rights. And then or finally also, we should look into the uh, assessment of likelihood and extent of potential harm uh, and uh, the potential reversibility of that harm, whether in fact it concerns what you could call a red line, a prohibited system or prohibited use of the system uh, as established by domestic or international law. So these are the main uh, let's say the main features of the Huderia uh, model that the Council of Europe will uh, likely, well, not likely, will develop it in the coming years. Negotiations on the, on the, on the um, binding legal instrument that I mentioned before will probably begin in May 2022. And uh, at the same time, we will also look into the establishment of this uh, human rights, uh, democracy and rule of law impact assessment model. Um, the big question is, of course, we are many, uh, we are many actors in the field of AI. And uh, Professor Borghese has mentioned before uh, the AI Act of the European Union. We are, of course, also very closely working with the European Union. We are working closely with the OECD. We are working closely with UNESCO uh, for on AI issues. Um, let's say, uh, what, where would our Huderia model be different from the one in the AI uh, that the, or the kind of impact assessments that the AI Act foresees? I think there's one major difference between our legislation 
uh, proposed legislation and the AI Act of the European Union. And that is that the AI Act of the European Union deals with the primarily with the placing on the market of uh, AI systems. So this is really about safety and, uh, and, 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 uh, and other requirements for placing a product on the market. But our approach is not related to the system itself. Our approach is related to the interplay between the system, human beings, and their rights and obligations under international law. So this is a slightly different approach. And also our approach is not, we have no, as you know, the Council of Europe is not at all competent when it comes to uh, market issues or economy issues. So we are only looking at it from the point of view of human rights, uh, democracy and rule of law. So these are the main features, the main difference between our uh, approach and the one that is in the AI Act. I hope that this is uh, somewhat uh, clearing up the matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. That was very, very interesting. I took loads of notes. Uh, I will be looking forward to May 2022 uh, then uh, and very excited to see how the Huderia model looks like. Um, and you mentioned the AI Act proposal of the European Union, and I think uh, it has been part of the conversation since the beginning. Uh, and I'm going to pass the floor to Daniel, uh, who uh, is actually going to talk about how do human rights impact assessment can look like within the context of the AI Act. Um, and having done uh, extensive work uh, on the file, um, it would be very interesting to hear what, what plays for the human rights impact assessment in the EU AI Act uh, proposal. Great, thanks. And uh, thanks again for the invitation to be here. It's been a fascinating discussion so far. Um, just to begin with a kind of commiseration about the acronyms. Um, also, I will point out that even though the AI Act has been referred to as an AIA in the US, AIA has usually meant algorithmic impact assessment. So there's already confusion there. And uh, we actually have a report coming out where there was discussion of the Canadian AIAs and the AI Act. And so serious acronym uh, difficulties ahead for everyone. Um, also, just a general point before I get into the AI Act about human rights impact assessments, because I think everyone's been working heavily on them. Um, and an issue that we've all run into is the kind of chicken and egg situation. It's like everyone, I think, agrees that a system that poses a high risk to fundamental rights should have an impact assessment done. But you sort of have to do an impact assessment to figure out if that needs to happen. And, you know, there's lots of different ways of approaching that and Christian just outlined this um, idea that's been put forward in the Kahai and Access Now has been an observer for the Kahai so we've been involved in that process um, of you know having an initial check to see if there's a risk posed and then there could be a fuller one. Um, in the AI Act we, we sort of start from a different point and, and I think we have to approach that um, differently. So the, the difference with the AI Act is that it's sort of pre-decided that certain use cases are high risk. So that question of which systems need to have the full impact is moot in the context of the AI Act because there's been this decision about which systems pose a high risk. Uh, we have this list in Annex 3 of high-risk AI systems. Um, we also have a, another risk category where we have prohibition, so unacceptable risk, um, but you know, ideally they're, they're neither on the market nor deployed, so there's no need for an assessment. Um, and then in Article 52, we also have systems that pose a risk of manipulation. So we have this risk categorization already, and, and then we can kind of talk about what needs to happen with those um, systems. Now, as Christian already pointed out, there is some form of an impact assessment in the AI Act as it stands, uh, which is called a conformity assessment. And just to not assume that everyone knows all the details, the AI Act basically focuses primarily on two sets of actors, providers, so that's companies, for example, who are putting systems on the market, developing them. Um, and then what it calls users, kind of confusingly, which is entities that are going to deploy a system. Uh, and that does not refer to yeah, end users or affected people. Um, the conformity assessment is something that the providers do. 
under the AI Act. So that's a company who's developing the system has to go through a series of you know, primarily quality checks. Um, it, there is some mention of fundamental rights, but not to the degree that we would want. Um, and you know, it, it again, this is a product safety legislation. So as Frederick pointed out, it may not be the ideal way to regulate AI, but what we're looking at at the moment is how to make it as good or as less bad an instrument um, as possible. So kind of being pragmatic at this point, but we can definitely have a discussion about whether uh, there's other models to approach things. Um, the big issue for, for us, um, and I'll just drop something in the chat here, which is a joint statement that Access Now and 115 other civil society organizations signed that calls for certain amendments to the AI Act to make it protect fundamental rights. And one thing that we pointed out there is that by placing all the obligations on providers, you really fail to protect people's rights because it, it's definitely the case that providers, so the, the entity developing an AI system has some capacity and there is a need for them to assess how this system will impact people down the line. You know, if you're looking at the data it's trained on, the design decisions, these all do have a downstream impact um, on, on the people who are affected. But the entity deploying the system is really, really central to how the system is going to impact fundamental rights. If you're using a system in a particular cultural context, in a particular city, in a particular neighborhood of a city, if you're talking about a facial recognition system, for example, or an entry, um, you know, a system that uses biometric verification to control uh, entry to, a, you know, a venue or something like that. If it's in a particular neighborhood, if it's in a particular place, all of these things are going to have a massive impact on how that system will impact fundamental rights. So the idea that the provider at that level could already anticipate all of those impacts is, is flawed. Now, that is not to say that the obligation there should be removed, but it should be complemented by an obligation at the user level. So the question of DPIAs pops up. Frederick already mentioned that. Um, is a data protection impact assessment enough at that level? Um, the EDPS and the EDPB in their joint opinion on the AI Act did make the interesting observation that any system that processes personal data and falls under the Annex 3 list of high-risk systems would have to do a DPIA because, you know, the DPIA obligation is not always totally clear when it needs to happen. Um, that is good, but it's not enough um, because as well, Frederick already mentioned, personal data... Um, is probably a bit of a loophole there. Uh, some, you know, there, there will be some AI systems that do not process personal data, but they could still fall under the high risk list. Um, there will be other ones that do process personal data, but the developer, the provider says that they don't. Uh, we see this often with the motion recognition systems and other forms of biometric categorization analysis um, that, you know, I've seen ridiculous things like companies who capture facial images, make biometric templates, and then process those uh, for inferences, claim that they only collect anonymous data. Uh, so, you know, really crazy stuff. Uh, so if, if that's left to the volition of the, the provider, the user, to determine whether it processes personal data, it's, it's going to create a massive loophole and we're just going to be, you know, in the same situation we're in now. So what we're, demanding is that all users of high-risk AI systems under the AI Act have to do a fundamental rights impact assessment. I'm open to other <laughs> acronyms. I'm not fixed on the acronym. The important thing is that there is an assessment of the impact on fundamental rights at the user level. Uh, what goes along with that um, is a transparency obligation. As you might know, in Article 60 of the AI Act, um, there's a provision for this EU-wide database um, and what that currently lists is what high-risk AI systems are on the market in the EU. That's good, but what we really need to know is where they're being used. And it seems to me completely arbitrary to only list what's on the market in that database. What we need to know is what's on the market, and then you look and you can see all the places it's being used. 
Um, this is not also this, I wouldn't see this as a restrictive measure as well. It's definitely a useful measure for civil society, for example, to find out about risky practices. But we do want to promote this ecosystem of excellence and trust. And we want to know where these systems are being used. If there are positive use cases, then other you know, uh, public authorities or companies can learn and say, oh, okay, this company here is using that. Um, I think unless you have something to hide, <laughs> then I don't see the reason not to include, you know, list the use. And if we're promoting an ecosystem of excellence and trust, then we shouldn't have anything to hide about the systems that we're using. Um, I'll wind it up there, but yeah, I think, the, you know, we can have a discussion about what that fundamental rights impact assessment should entail one thing that we're proposing that's maybe a bit novel is that the user should have to identify affected people by the system and i mentioned that there's only two categories of actors that are really dealt with by the ai act providers and users we're saying that any user when they're procuring and about to deploy a high-risk ai system should identify affected people and the, the fact that they're using the system and the identification of affected people should be included in the database as well. The reason that we're asking for this is, you know, it's good practice. They should think about who they're identifying. But it's been pointed out that the AI system provides no rights to people who are affected. And what this obligation to identify affected people would do is it would create a potential rights holder. Uh, and we're also asking conjointly to have uh, rights to redress and some other rights to be accorded to people who are identified as affected communities. So, yeah, we can get into all this later, but uh, that's an initial uh, contribution. Thank you, Daniel. That I'm sure we'll get into that later. I'm sure that uh, there will be a, a debate about that. And, and I see that the conversation in the chat is getting very active, uh, which is great. Uh, so please uh, be ready to prepare your questions uh, for all the panelists, uh, and I'm sure that it's going to uh, a very interesting debate is going to ensue. Uh, moving to Cornelia and to industry, um, the question that I'm going to ask is: Do these mythical creatures that we call human rights impact assessments exist in practice, and is Microsoft doing them? How how do they look like uh, from the perspective of the industry? Thanks, Alex, uh, for the question. Thanks already for a really interesting uh, conversation, uh, bringing all these different elements together will probably occupy us for quite some time. Um, I'll say first, uh, most generally, that Microsoft um, follows uh, the guiding, the UN guiding principles for business and, and human rights. Uh, throughout its processes overall. We also do have uh, transparency report, annual reports on this topic. Uh, I'll share the link uh, once I'm done with speaking. So you can have a look at how that looks, uh, looks like. Uh, that covers, of course, a broader range of topics from um, supply chain to, to privacy, lawful access, content moderation, et cetera. Um, more specifically on AI, um, as you probably know, we have been um, developing our standard uh, based on the principles that Microsoft has committed to um, in, in for responsible AI. And I think it's important we do this, of course, in, if you like, in, in, a, in, a, in a time where we have at the same time and in parallel, the legislative conversations that we equally follow very closely because at one point in the future, of course, what we are currently doing ideally aligns to what the law might require us to do. Um, so we have looked at how we can actually operationalize these principles, accountability, transparency, inclusion. Um, and that's not as easy. And I think what, what Frederick and, and Daniel have pointed to, this is socio-technical. It, um, it depends on the context. Uh, it might depend on, on the technology itself. It might be different from when you think about facial recognition technology versus um, text translation, for example, uh, you have different different issues that might be more important uh, 
in the one than the other or you know accuracy for example is something that you might be able to achieve uh, in one of those systems but cultural diversity is something that plays a role in others in particular in language so the the, the variety of how you actually achieve these goals becomes really complex, not only by the different scenarios, but also eventually by the algorithmic models that you are using. Um, and that complexity um, makes, makes this, or necessitates to make um, these processes really agile. Um, so we have, um, we've been working on this um, it, to, to formulate for our engineering groups, if you like, general requirements that they are all now um, uh, mandated to, to apply. I will also say, and this is, I think, beyond before I go into the details and how these look like, um, just to say that um, in Microsoft, we are now obliged, uh, we have a mandatory training on responsible AI. So all Microsoft employees have to do this. Um, and we, we have a system in place in order to scale the work on responsible AI through uh, AI champs. So in each organization, there's one person appointed to make sure that these requirements will be understood and implemented. Um, so, so there's a lot of work going on to, to sort of also shift mindset uh, so that people understand um, you know, what, what it means to responsibly develop AI. Um, so um, going back to the standard, um, these are channel requirements um, that are formulated as objectives and processes uh, towards specific goals, such as accountability, transparency, fairness, reliability, safety, privacy, security, and inclusiveness. I will say that the specific standard um, doesn't specific look at privacy as this is already covered uh, by our privacy uh, standard uh, that implements um, basically laws such as GDPR, not only, um, and inclusiveness goals are also already covered by our accessibility standard that is already existing. But of course, as we saw with the DPIA, there is an interplay so when we look at how we comply with AI, we look at uh, how we comply with GDPR, this is obviously something we do in all the systems uh, in which personal data is processed, right? So um, then what does it actually mean um, to, to have these requirements? Um, we have sort of tried to fix or, or, or spe specify specific goals under each of these commitments. When you think about accountability, for example, uh, one, one objective and one process that in the standard is determined in more detail is an impact assessment. And the impact assessment, I think that's also really relevant in comparison to GDPR, is broadly looking at impact, not only on the data subject, but you know, it's, it's this question about, okay, what are you, why are you building the system? Who will be negatively impacted? Who will be positively, who, who, who will the system serve so that we get a broader um, view on this? Um, but, well, the, 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 the requirements will oblige the engineering team to have an oversight of significant adverse impacts, whether it is fit for purses, purpose, um, it requires a data governance and management and human oversight and control. When it comes to transparency, um, it, you know, um, this, there is specific um, goals described to make the system intelligible for decision-making, uh, how to communicate to stakeholders. Um, so this is, for example, when we issue transparency notes to customers in order to understand the capabilities, but also the limitations of the system and um, disclosure of AI interaction, um, something that you also find uh, to a certain extent in the, um, in the um, AI Act. Um, the, the third commitment is to fairness. And this really tries to achieve um, quality of service and you know thinking about for example 
that different demographic groups will receive the same quality of the service. Um, how do you think about allocation of resources and opportunities? And how do you minimize stereotyping, demeaning, or erasing outputs? So we are, we are looking at this uh, really towards what are we trying to achieve and how do we get there? And this is how the standard is sort of described for the engineering groups. Um, then this is of, of course, um, and I'm, I'm not going to all the other um, objectives and goals, otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll sit here for, for quite some time. And I wanted to say that um, we oblige, um, so, so these standards are obligatory for all AI systems. It reminds me a little bit of what Christian was saying, um, that of course, in order to identify the high risk, um, you have to do the impact assessment. When we identify high risks, um, which we, we, we call internally uh, sensitive use cases, we have them separated or divided in three categories. And I think they're recognizable again when you think about the AI Act and the high risk categorization. The one is um, AI systems that might have an impact on people's lives, uh, such as, of course, allocation of, for example, um, social benefits or um, loans uh, or in the context of education or justice. Um, then um, sensitive uses that that uh, relate to um, harms, physical harms in particular, but not only. And then, of course, the third category is the human rights framework. Um, so potential risks to fundamental rights. Uh, here, you would think about uh, uses use cases, a refuse of facial recognition technologies um, when either engineering groups or sales organizations um, have um, are, are confronted with these type of potential risks, um, then the system has to go through a, through a specific review. So there is a specific scaling so that um, a, a special group of people that work on on these ethical issues will have a review in, on, and define mitigation strategies um, uh, for, for those sp special uses. So there is a, there is a, it almost looks to me um, and, and that, that it aligns a little bit more with the thinking that we just heard from Christian um, on, on the process, but these are sort of what we are internally doing. Um, and then I, I will leave my comments to the AI Act, maybe maybe for a little bit later, because otherwise I, I have taken too, too much of my time already. Uh, thank you very much, Cornelia, and thank you very much, uh, everybody. Um, I'm now going to open the floor uh, for everybody to be able to ask their questions. And, and, I, and I see again that the chat is, is uh, very active. Um, perhaps to, to, to kickstart the, the open conversation, um, I will identify a bit the themes that I feel like are coming out, uh, taking notes from all, the, all of the speeches. So other than the name, uh, which I don't think uh, for all intents and purposes, and with all the enthusiasm that we have, I don't think we'll manage to, to decide on an acronym today between ourselves, um, but, but attempts have been made in the chat and, and some of them sound very, very good. Um, I think the other questions that that we get uh, are when when do we get to do them? Who does them? Uh, what what are we assessing? Uh, and who reviews uh, what has been assessed? I think these are all very big questions that again I, I don't necessarily think. And yes, exactly when. Um, so I don't think we'll manage to to get uh, final answers on this. But but perhaps um, putting all of these. Into, into perspective, I feel that all of you have agreed that they are, if correctly done, and if properly done, good ideas. Um, so then I think I'll, I'll kickstart the, the, the conversation myself by asking, uh, given that they are such a good idea, what are the barriers that we see in uh, getting them adopted? And I think Frederick has mentioned the, the lack of a legal basis um, as a potential barrier, uh, and some others have been potentially identified, you know, if we talk about, about the EU AI Act, it was potentially the, the legal basis and, and being market focused. 
Um, but maybe if if you if you'd like to just draw those out more clearly, and maybe starting with with Laura once again, since she started the panel and she and since she also has looked at many many countries and how they they look at their strategies. Uh, Laura, if 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 you'd like to to speak on that, if not, I'm I'm happy to to pass the the, the floor to to somebody else. Thanks, Alexander. Yeah, I can just jump in quickly with maybe two points. Um, actually, with the first issue of the acronyms, which thinking deeply actually is it, it has impact. Um, and when we think about what Canada did with the with the automated decision making, automated is not the same as AI, and could really pose problems when we look at, for instance, um, whether whether a hiring um, system. That this I think there was a case in in, in Canada where the hiring tool that was used by the Department of Defense uh, could be, uh, uh, or the rules of the directive um, could apply to, to this case. And that the, the argument there was, well, the, the fact that there was a human looking at the application of this tool uh, render it not automated. So, so then therefore the directive would, wouldn't apply. And this is interesting because just a matter of, of an acronym of a name has an impact on whether it would be applicable. So perhaps something to think of uh, later as we move on with different tools. And with regards to human rights impact assessments, yes, as, as you mentioned, and as we are developing here, it would be interesting to see uh, at limitations that already many scholars and experts, I see Vania Skorek is here, and she wrote an excellent report in these, which are the limitations of human rights impact assessments in terms of um, what's the appropriate scope? I think Christian already mentioned the elements that the area will have, um, but it remains to, to, to be seen which other elements need, would need to be included or, or, or what's going to be the, the practice that is going to develop out of it. As the, at the moment, what we're seeing is that the, the, the elements that it should contain um, remain to be seen. The other thing is with regards to the scalability. And scalability, because of course most most uh, let's say large uh, enterprises would have uh, or be able to to conduct human rights impact assessment. But what about small medium enterprises? What about small companies where this could be very costly? As I said, you need social technical expertise for conducting proper uh, human rights impact assessments, and and then. Uh, who can access to these very limited uh, social technical expertise for AI systems. So, so something to think of. We need a lot, as I said from the beginning, capacity building and, and learn from, from experiences and practice. And, and maybe last but not least, uh, timing. And there was this paper by Mark Latonera on a human rights impact assessment uh, conducted by a company in Malaysia. And, and it was interesting whether it posed a question, whether it should be ex ante, going back to the to Daniel's points of the, egg, the chicken and egg question, uh, or first we need to identify if, if there are high risk in the first place, or, or whether they should be exposed or during. And, and kind of his uh, comment is that they should be ongoing. So maybe this is something to explore, but of course it will add into, into cost, into, into the scalability problem. Uh, and I'll leave it to that, just more questions and answers. And I hope that my colleagues, particularly uh, fellow co-panelists, and of course, Vanny, if you want to jump in, but um, over to you, Alexander. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And, and I see a, a hand raised, and, and you mentioned Vanya, and I hope you don't mind me uh, addressing you by your first name. Um, I think I'm going to do this with, with everybody who wants to participate. Uh, and then I see Daniel's hands being raised. But uh, Vanya, over to you first, uh, and then I'll pass it to Daniel. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for organizing this uh, really useful, important, and excellent panel. And thank you to all the speakers so far uh, for excellent presentations and, and um, noting really the key points. Uh, I, I, I love that this conversation is really not too technical, but it's going to the heart of the issues. So it's it's not on a broad uh, uh, level of uh, you know principles, but really going into the uh, details of, of what can be most useful. I'm Vanya Škoric. I'm a program director from the European Center for Not for Profit Law, and we are part of the group of, of observing organizations at the CAHAI process. We represent the um, conference of INGOs. So uh, we were lucky enough to contribute to the draft uh, of the future CAHAI uh, document, especially in the working group on impact assessment. Uh, so I, I am very, very happy that the CAHAI's work is currently, I would say, the most progressive one uh, and most detailed one on, on this topic. And in particular, 
uh, it answers two important questions that I think EU and other jurisdictions could look at as a, a, a good example to include. The first question is, what do we want from trustworthy AI? If the trust in AI systems and applications is the proclaimed goal, which it is by EU and other jurisdictions, then this instrument of human rights impact assessment or broader Kuderia is really the key instrument to achieve uh, uh, the trust because there will be no trust by the public, especially affected groups, if they don't feel reassured that everything has been done before the deployment of the AI system to mitigate any harms. Uh, we see that ongoing working on the ground with communities, with organizations, a growing frustration uh, swelling up uh, from all the cases and situations of AI fallouts that we have witnessed uh, and, and scandals that we have heard in many, many countries, including Western democracy countries. So this is one point where impact assessment can really uh, be useful instrument. The second point is uh, going to what Laura mentioned, which is the agility. We of course don't want the rules and legislation that will not be applicable, that will not be implementable. And uh, there must be uh, an agile enough instrument to complement different sizes, different sectors, and so on. So I really like uh, the, the idea uh, that was included in Kahai draft, if, if I may just reveal that part without revealing too much of the content, which is actually to have stages of human rights impact assessment. The full impact assessment would be reserved for those high risk uh, uh, AI systems. But, but as Daniel noted, and a couple of other people, it's a chicken and egg problem. What is missing from the EU approach, and nobody yet managed to answer that from any institution, is what is the methodology for populating Annex 3 of high risk AI applications? What is the actual steps that determine how these high risk listed systems impact human rights in order to be put on a high risk? So this is the missing piece. This is the missing link from the EU AI, uh, AI regulation, let's call it, right? So the question is answered in Kahai document in a way that for all of the AI systems being developed, designed even, there should be some kind of very small scale initial review, initial scanning, if you want a triage uh, of impact assessment on human rights, democracy, and rule of law. That will help categorizing the risk level. And then after the risk level shows that there is a need for a more robust human rights impact assessment, they go into more robust. If it's really high risk, they can go into even more robust uh, uh, um, uh, process. And this is where, and then that goes back to Laura's question in the chat. This is where we ask, how can standardization bodies that are working on standardization on some of these issues and topics, how can they play a role to help us devise these methodologies, scaling them up from a very basic triage to a mid-level, let's say I would even add the third level, not, not only two levels, but the mid-level human rights impact assessment to a full complex one for really intrusive systems that are really almost on the border of being most likely bad, right? And to then go back to the question of limitations, there are two important key aspects that we also address in our papers that I put in the chat to help with RIA being really meaningful. First one is oversight. There must be some kind of accountability or oversight mechanism that checks and then provides possibility for appeal or redress how these uh, uh, instruments and processes have been conducted. So if a company conducts the initial uh, triage level human rights impact assessment, that must be in, a, in some way, the findings of it must be published in order to be able to contest it. And it goes higher up as, as the level is uh, uh, increasing, the uh, oversight should increase, external oversight. The second one is meaningful participation of external stakeholders. I completely understand that company itself, especially small size one cannot have knowledge in-house 
to do this type of assessment. There must be methodologies developed and we are trying to work on that from our side as well with civil society and human rights groups to include meaningfully stakeholders and all potentially affected groups and communities to give their voice into these uh, processes. How to do it is a really open question, but I think it will be a make or break question uh, for these instruments. And this is something we are happy to collaborate on with many of the people on the panel here already to address. Thank you. Vanya, if I can just, sorry, thank you very, very much. That was an incredibly useful contribution. And I see that hands started going up very quickly uh, after you, you raised the, some of these issues. Um, I think Daniel's hand was first up, then Frederick, then Cordelia. But as I said, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, and definitely you will see reactions uh, from, uh, from everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to, to pick up on a few points. Um, I think I would stress again what both Frederick and I said that we're, we're approaching the AI Act not as an ideal instrument here and we're really looking at fixing something that's maybe not entirely great and getting the best we can out of it. So the proposal that I mentioned about human rights or fundamental rights impact assessments on users, I, I would stress that it, we're not seeing this as something that's actually going to really stop harms. I mean, if someone is deploying a, you know, biometric categorization system to determine access to education based on facial recognition. I mean, this thing needs to be burnt. <laughs> Any kind of fundamental rights impact assessment at the user level is not going to, you know, remove or be able to mitigate the harms of a system like that because it's so problematic. Like there will be cases and I think it's a good exercise for users to go through, but this is not some kind of a silver bullet. And that's why I mentioned that it has to be tied to transparency because the situation that we're in at the moment is we don't know what systems on the market are on the market. We don't know where they're deployed. We rely on you know, organizations like Algorithm Watch to do investigative journalism to find out where things are being deployed. And then we have to go to litigation. So the idea that you know, of this user level fundamental rights impact assessment would be to give basic information. And I, I would push back on the idea that it's too complex for small businesses. I think, you know, the conformity assessment is perhaps more complex, but a, like a basic idea of like, what is the system? What is it intended to do? What rights does it impact? You know, a list of information that any user who is deciding to deploy something that's clearly labeled as high risk AI system in a context has to know the, the idea that they don't have that information and that they haven't gone through that process is laughable. I mean, if they haven't, then they shouldn't be deploying it. But it, it's simply a matter of just making public information that, that you have to have uh, thought about. So th that and you know, we can discuss how to design these impact assessments to ensure that they're you know, not overburdensome, but I, I think it's a basic process of you know, responsible, yeah, not even development, it's just responsible thinking and behavior uh, to have thought about these um, impacts. Um, I think on the idea about um, having a fuller, uh, impact assessment. Article 64 of the AI Act is really interesting. Um, it allows human rights um, enforcement bodies to both have access to all documentation created um, during the conformity assessment and where that's not possible or where that's not sufficient for their investigation of a potential harm uh, to actually test the system. I think we could, we could beef this up a bit um, and have the possibility that say you know as a potentially affected person or a civil society organization we see that a public authority is deploying a high-risk ai system there has to be a mechanism for people to trigger that article 64 process um, to allow this more thorough investigation and i think that's where we're looking at you know a third party an independent assessment of the impact that can really look at and actually test the system so having that that's the the level i think of impact assessment that can really yeah have an impact um this other one that would have to be applied across the board is, is just providing basic transparency and it also if it turns out down the line that serious 
obvious impacts were missed, were not considered, if certain groups who were likely to be affected were not considered. Um, I think that also builds a case that the, the entity deploying the system was negligent. So that can feed into to things later. And just a final point on the, the methodology for what we're kind of referring to as risk designation. So whether it's unacceptable risk, high risk, I, I think it's, it's very strange that there's no criteria uh, for what constitutes unacceptable risk in the AI Act. And I think there has to be a mechanism. So say, for example, under Article 64, a data protection authority or an equality body investigates a system and actually uncovers that it poses far higher risks to fundamental rights than was anticipated. There should be a mechanism for the risk level to increase. Uh, for Article 5, so the list of prohibited practices to be updated. Um, it, it can't be the case that that's a closed category, whereas um, Annex 3 can be potentially open. So we need to have explicit categories and we need to have a mechanism for systems to be reclassified um, based on investigations. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think Frederick uh, was uh, the next in the order of uh, raised hands. Frederick, please. Thank you. Wow, this is, I hear so many interesting things. And on top of that in the chat, so it's a hard, it's going to be hard to um, not talk too long. So Alex, stop me when I am overly enthusiastic. Um, I hear very many smart remarks. Um, so I agree, S small firms, I, it is sad if they have to spend a lot of money on an impact assessment, but they can do loads of damage. And yeah, in um, real life, uh, it's also probably too expensive for a startup to start a chemical plant because they, they cannot hire the expertise needed to, um, uh, to protect uh, uh, the, the neighborhoods around them and, uh, and the woods and the, and the lakes. So at least partly, we think we have to accept it, that certain levels of impact assessments, yeah, may be expensive, but um, if you can't do it, we accept that in a lot of um, um, situations, right? Like, like uh, any hobby person cannot start selling cars without going through the safety checks. So uh, um, we have to keep that into account, I think. Um, also, I do the same. Um, we talk a lot about AI, but if you are the person whose pension payments are stopped, or like in the Netherlands, whose child benefits payments stop, it doesn't really matter if they are stopped by an extremely simple uh, notion in an Excel sheet or in a super high tens of millions of euros um, uh, machine learning AI system. So perhaps it would be better, um, but I make the same mistake, to talk about automated decision making or even partly automated decision making to escape the problems that uh, Laura mentioned in Canada. Um, and one more last quick remark. Um, however, we write I think we need um, uh, legal requirements, like not hints, not suggestions, requirements. But we have to think of some smart way, but that's doable, to uh, combine a hard legal requirement, for instance, in the European Union, in an EU regulation, but of course, treaties, regulations, and outside Europe, uh, national acts are uh, it's time consuming to amend them. So we need some type of smart combination of um, a hard requirement in law with guidance by regulators that can be um, uh, updated more often without going through the whole circus of adopting a new regulation. I realize there's a bit of not there's there's a risk of democratic legitimacy lacking for such soft law, but we, uh, but it's doable and we um, we have to think of some system with uh, different levels of um, uh, adaptable legislation. Two, I have more points, but I'll leave it at this because um, I see more hands. Thank you very much. And, and it's great to hear the optimism. Uh, it's, it's very, very encouraging to hear that we can do it. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Cornelia, I think you were next. <laughs> 
Yes, and, and as with Frederick, there's so many good points made. It's hard, sort of, where, where do you want to focus in on? I wanted to say something uh, on the legal basis, and I'm glad that Christian is, is, is the next speaker because it's a half a question to him as well. Because and under European law, we do have, um, you know, uh, directives that implement some of the fundamental rights very specifically, such as non-discrimination or gender equality. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether it wouldn't be possible to be more specific uh, about um, the fundamental rights that the, that the act is trying to protect. In particular, it's mentioned in, in, in the prescription of the AI Act and in some of the uh, recitals in a very vague way, but, but being a little bit more precise would probably help. Um, I also, Daniel, I think you mentioned that, um, you know, looking at the product safety approach the Commission has taken, um, some of the transparency to, to the potentially impacted citizens slash consumers slash customers um, will, um, would be avoidable if we had thought about this responsible AI uh, um, as a life cycle, which starts, of course, with the provider and ends with the deployer of the system. And so focusing on transparency towards the potentially impacted um, citizens um, will have to have in, in the context in which it is deployed in order to even think about the potential redress mechanisms. And we, 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 we have been a little bit struggling with seeing actually ourselves and which role do we actually fall in because um, at, at times we are component providers to systems very often. Um, we are also very often co-creating with our customers, or we have the general purpose AI systems that potentially will be fine-tuned by customers for their specific uses. Um, and the AI Act, even now with the compromise text from the Slovenian presidency, still is quite confusing, in particular as roles can change depending on what the deployer does. So thinking backwards, in having an obligations at the very end, closest to the potentially impacted user, and then making sure that well, they have to use components or AI systems that can fulfill these requirements. Because of course, even where now in the Slovenian presidency text, the, the, um, the, the deployer, the user becomes the provider, um, he will not always have all the, the, the necessary knowledge and he will still require the downward chain uh, in the stakeholders to provide and support um, the, the, the potential necessary documentation throughout the text. So that's sort of something that I think can be fixed in, in the AI Act in particular, if you're more, con more specific. Um, and then there is some something else that um, I so I agree with with Frederick by the way on the SME piece and I think about the many small uh, companies that have developed um, or smaller companies that that are in the medical space for example and they have to go through very uh, stringent um, uh, processes in order to get their new medicine um, through to the marketplace so. Um, and last is really how do we actually, and it, it goes a little bit to what I started at the very beginning, how do you actually understand how what the legal requirements that are listed in the AI Act are supposed to achieve? Because it's not clear in the text. I mean, the, the much cited error-free data um, is very clear. I, we, we believe it, it, it aims at having a system that is less biased and doesn't discriminate, but it doesn't really say so. And so I think if we were to say, you know, the, 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 which of the requirements serve accountability, which of the requirements serve transparency, we would actually already be in a better place to, um, 
to to make them more impactful and i leave it by that but the question really on the legal basis something that that i i, I still think the commission could have focused a little bit more on fundamental rights in in the text as well um th thank you cornelia i think that's a, a an opinion shared by by many people uh, present here or otherwise uh, and, and you said uh, in the beginning of your speech very rightfully that Christian is the is the next to take the floor. So Christian, please. And I think you have a, a bunch of questions that were addressed to you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I think so. To start with the with the important question raised uh, by uh, Cornelia about the legal basis. I mean, I'm I'm just want to say here obviously i cannot speak on behalf of the european commission i work in the european in the council of europe so it's a different organization uh, but i used to work before in the european commission so i know a little bit about how it uh, how, how it goes about i think that the reason for the human rights impact being having no strong legal basis in the ai act is probably that the act is legally speaking based on the internal market regulations on not and not on uh, on on regulation on 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 the parts of the treaty, which uh, deals with uh, fundamental rights. So that may be one explanation why this is sort of not so clear what the that there is a human rights legal basis for the uh, for the impact assessment in the in the AI Act. And to come back to also a question of, of the legal basis and the rights and where do we put them? I think it's also very important when we talk about the rights here in the, in the, in, in, in the context of AI, especially human rights impact, that it, we do not actually need a new set of human rights for uh, dealing with AI. What we need to ensure is that the existing human rights are uh, seamlessly translated into an AI context. That means that, to give you an example, if I'm a civil servant in a state and I uh, am supposed to decide on uh, whether somebody is allowed to have a certain, uh, should be give, granted a certain allowance or not, and I decide that based on bias, uh, for, for, and I'm biased in my decisions on that, I, do, I give it to people who uh, have a certain background or people who look uh, like me or something like that, then of course it's obviously it's obviously illegal. And we know that it's, it's illegal under your administrative law, it's illegal under your uh, constitution, uh, many, it is, it, is, it is discrimination. So it's also against uh, the European Convention on Human Rights in Europe. Uh, I think that that's pretty clear. Why should it be different if it is an AI system that does it or helps you doing it through the automated decision-making or uh, assisted uh, decision-making by through an AI system? That there is no difference. The, the issue here is the accountability. What we have, the, what is specific in my view to the AI is that we have accepted in a certain way that uh, we, have a, we all have a black box up here. You know, things come in through the ears and they come out through the mouth and we do not necessarily always know why we have made certain connections up there in our brains. But we can at least, we, but we're used to that. We're used to dealing with humans. We used to know that humans can be biased. And the problem with AI is that we also have black boxes in AI systems. We have, we don't know why a certain data set sometimes may be developed into a certain result in the other end. The prop, but with the AI, we have a tendency to believe that it is less fallible than humans because it's a system, it is, uh, and it is automated. We have this idea that it must be less fallible and that is uh, of course not the correct assumption to make here so what we need to make and, and and this is why if you know if you apply ai systems which of course alone through the way of functioning can it can achieve a scale of uh, you know uh, of, of 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 negative impact that is not possible for a human being uh, then we need to make sure that, you know, we have the, the measures to mitigate those risks. We must ban them. If we cannot mitigate them, we can put them under a moratorium, etc. But we need to make sure that we, know we are not, let's say, defenseless towards the, 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 the AI system in any more than we would have been defenseless towards human 
uh, humans taking these decisions alone or on their own. I think these are, I just wanted to point this out uh, because I think it is sometimes we have a tendency to discuss very much the system itself. And I'm, uh, the system is interesting for the engineers, but it is not so interesting in a, in a human rights context. There it's really the interplay between the system and the people that the humans that use the system to make decisions and those who are in the end impacted by those decisions. That is really the issue here. And this is also why I say we don't need specific rules for this. We don't need specific new things for this, or new, new regulations for this. What we need there is to ensure that we don't have a legal vacuum and uh, uh, because we're using AI. Thank you very much, Christian. That was very, very insightful. Um, I think Daniel has put his hand up again. So I am going to give the floor to him. Uh, and after that, maybe if each of you uh, can think of a, of a final remark that you would like to, to transmit to everybody else before we, we finish, since unfortunately we just have five more minutes. Daniel, please. Great, just very quickly on the general purpose AI systems. So Cornelia brought this up. I don't know if all of you have seen the most recent, uh, the first compromise text from the council, the Slovenian presidency. They've actually added an, a new title um, to deal with general purpose AI systems. And I don't think they've done it the right way because there's two questions. There's, does the AI act as it stands deal correctly with general purpose AI systems? And how should it, deal with them. I, I'm not opposed to the idea of adding a new title or a new article to look at, you know, have a, a different approach to providers or to, you know, companies like Microsoft, Google, who place general purpose systems on the market. But what the, what the Slovenian presidency text has done is basically just give, you know, cart, like they just, there are no obligations now. You're basically off the hook. And I think that's based on a flawed assumption that there are no risks visible or that come from the general purpose system and the way it's designed. And if you look at large language models, for example, tend to be trained off databases, um, linguistic uh, data sets that contain very, very problematic language, which tends to be reproduced in the text that they, so we've seen this with GPT-3 and, and other large language models that they will uh, replicate biases from the text that they were trained on. They will say incredibly racist, sexist, and problematic things. So I, I'm up for them being treated separately, but I think, again, we need an impact assessment um, at that level to see how the design decisions, the data they were trained on, um, can also lead to, to problems, regardless of whether they're implemented in one of the use cases that falls under Annex 3. Thank you very much, Daniel. And we have three more minutes. So perhaps if I um, if I go again through through all the panelists, uh, just after saying thank you very much uh, to you all for participating, and thank you to all the panelists for the very very interesting contributions, and then answering the the questions and uh, advising everybody to read the chat because there are very very interesting things there, and um, everybody has shared various documents and links, which I think are really important to to check. Um, going again in the order we, which we began and starting with you, Laura, just very quickly, if you have any, any final thoughts. Thanks, Alex, and thank you then again for everyone. I took a lot of notes. Um, just to say that risk-based approaches to artificial intelligence governance, including tools like accountability tools such as human rights impact assessments, are very likely to play a central role in, in how AI governance strategies develop. Um, I think there, there is, is we should look positively at what human rights impact assessments, uh, the work of, of Council of Europe is doing, particularly uh, they will play a significant role in, in translating all this complexity of, of, of requirements for AI systems and streamline with the human inter international human rights framework. So, so there are a lot of reasons to remain positive, um, but also with the considerations that, that were discussed here, there are a lot of things to, to still to be addressed. Um, this is something that, that the, good, the good news is that we are doing it together and ideally with the work of the different international organizations, civil society, multi-stakeholder approaches to, to AI governance are, are the way forward. So uh, last but not least, I, I would like to uh, um, 
to invite you. There's another work, workshop tomorrow, globalpolicy.ai. So the, the discussion will continue on how international cooperation would be key for, for translating all these efforts into better AI governance. So I'll leave it to that and I'll put the link here in the chat. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Frederick. Um, well, I have one minute left. Um, a suggestion for a new um, a panel sometime. Um, so uh, different people highlighted. Um, uh, so um, repairing the AI Act is difficult. I think they're well-meaning, by the way, the European Commission, but there are serious problems with it. That made me realize that NGOs, but me too, as an academic, I only write, wrote about it after the proposal was there. Can we do better to, to publish more before proposals are there? Um, like um, Perhaps that could be useful in the future, but this is too big a discussion. Uh, so this will probably need another panel another time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, and, and an interesting challenge there. Thank you very much, Christian. Yes, thank you very much. And I will actually follow up on what Frederick just said. I think that an inclusive process on legislation on something as a, important as AI is crucial. We, have, we need to have a discussion, broad social societal discussion about the uses of AI. Not, we cannot just leave this to industry. We cannot just leave this to the, to the technicians or the politicians uh, or the administrators. We need to have a real discussion about AI. Thank you. With the risk of being uh, of the Zoom meeting ending before uh, we managed to get to it, Daniel and Cornelia very quickly. And just thank you everyone for the great discussion. I'll pass to Cornelia quickly. <laughs> Daniel, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, same here uh, as the host, uh, organizer of the, of, of the discussion. I, I thank everybody for, for participating and um, I will, I will say maybe we, you know, we need not only to think about uh, the AI systems in, in, in responsible AI life cycles, but also the humans that use them and uh, deploy them, uh, which is part of that. Um, and then whether we just want to avoid, um, you know, the biases that exist to be replicated or whether an objective is also to actually get better and how AI can eventually help there too. So there is like open questions for certainly other discussions. So I was excited to be with you on this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all. Thank you Cornelia and Microsoft for, uh, for organizing and allowing us to come together and uh, hopefully see you at another panel soon to, to keep the discussion going.